January 1967, Quang Nam Province. A marine rifle company sets an L-shaped ambush along a known trail. The NVA column enters the kill zone at 0200 hours. 14 M16 rifles fire on command. Nine rifles jam after the first magazine. Click, then nothing. The jungle breathes back wet cordite and a dry click louder than gunfire. The AK-47 owns the jungle narrative from 1965 through early 1967. Newspapers run stories of rifles clogged with mud and carbon. Congressional hearings in May 1967 spotlight the M16 as a death trap. The perception crystallizes. Soviet engineering beats American innovation in close quarters chaos. By spring 1967, every firefight is framed as a reliability referendum and the verdict looks settled. The M16A1 fires a 5.56x 45mm cartridge at 700 to 900 rounds per minute. Eugene Stoner designs the system around IMR powder and tight tolerances. The Army switches to ball powder in 1964 without recalibrating the gas system. Carbon fouls the chamber and bolt after 150 rounds. Early fielded rifles lacked chrome-lined chambers and many units initially deployed without cleaning kits. Soldiers carry 6.8 pounds loaded versus 9.5 pounds for an AK or Type 56. That 2.8 pound gap doubles the ammunition a rifleman hauls on patrol. The 5.56 round tumbles inside 200 meters and fragments on bone. The AK fires a heavier 7.62 times 39 mm round with less fragmentation but deeper penetration. In theory, the M16 delivers controllable three round bursts and faster target transitions. In practice, jams erase every advantage when the bolt locks open mid magazine. Colt and the Army Materiel Command launch parallel fixes in late 1966, chrome plating the chamber and bore cuts friction and corrosion. Buffer springs and extractors receive harder alloys. Within months, the rifle evolves from liability to a weight and volume system performance first, reputation later. Field notes from early 1967 describe markedly fewer extraction failures in monsoon muck, once chrome and revised. Buffers were installed. November 1965, Ia Drang Valley, Central Highlands. The 1st Cavalry Division, Airmobile, lands with early M16 prototypes. Soldiers praise the weight advantage during Helleborn insertions. After three days of contact, the rifles begin failing in red clay dust. A platoon leader's after-action note estimated roughly 30% of weapons jammed during a single ambush. We carried twice the ammo but fired half the rounds when it counted. The AK performs with minimal maintenance under identical conditions. NVA troops recover abandoned M16S and use them until magazines run dry. The contrast becomes a talking point in Stars and Stripes by December 1965. An internal ordnance memo from late 1965 put stoppages above 1 in 10 in dusty endurance strings well outside acceptance limits for a service rifle. Ordnance officers attribute failures to operator error and inadequate training. Soldiers counter that the AK requires no training to run in monsoon mud. The Army fast tracks a study of bolt carrier fouling and extractor breakage. Test strings at Aberdeen Proving Ground logged jam rates above 10% during approximately 500 round endurance runs. That rate is four times the AK's observed failure threshold in the same test. Field reports from IV Corps echo the Ia Drang complaints through early 1966. Ambush teams in the Mekong Delta canals describe rifles locking open after two magazines. The perception cements. The M16 is a range queen that fails under operational stress. Click. Then nothing becomes the shorthand for a betrayed expectation. Not a training gap but a materials and propellant mismatch baked into the gas curve. January to August 1967, US, ordnance depots across South Vietnam. Colt delivers chrome-lined barrels and chambers to replace existing uppers. 
The Marine Corps leads the retrofit at Da Nang and Chu Lai. Chrome cut our jam rate in half the first month, and we hadn't changed anything else. Cleaning kits arrive in May 1967 with bore brushes, chamber brushes, and comic strip guides. The Army pushes hundreds of thousands of kits by mid-1, 9, 6, 7, saturating line units. Units begin mandatory daily cleaning checks tied to morning formations. Armourers swap buffer springs and extractors during weekly maintenance windows. The 1st Infantry Division logs a drop from 12% jams to under 4% by August 1967. After action reviews credit the fixes, but note that AK reliability still anchors enemy confidence. A company from the 1st Cavalry conducts a controlled ambush near Bong Son in late September 1967. An after-action report recorded 1,400 rounds in 90 seconds with no reported stoppages. Three clean bursts per target, no clicks, and we walked away with their weapons. The kill zone density overwhelms a reinforced NVA platoon before return fire organises. The official after-action report highlights ammunition expenditure and zero mechanical failures. Word spreads through brigade, but the broader army and press miss the narrative shift. Follow-on trials with ball powder and chrome saw stoppages drop into the low single digits under endurance fire. Good enough that tactics, not mechanics, became decisive. Congressional hearings continue into October 1,967 still citing 1,966 failure data. The technical fix outpaces the reputational repair by at least six months. While the AK remained reliable, the improved M16 made reliability tactically irrelevant. 1,967 to 1,968 night ambush belts in Quang Nam and Thua Thien provinces. Marine and Army rifle companies shift to deliberate L-shaped and linear ambushes. The improved M16A1 allows riflemen to carry 420 rounds versus 210 for 7.62mm weapons. Doubled ammunition capacity extends engagement time and suppresses counterattack attempts. A marine company sets an ambush along Highway 1 north of Hue in December 1967. The unit reports 18 confirmed kills with 2,000. 100 rounds expended in under three minutes. No M16 malfunctions appear in the after-action summary. Cyclic rate of 750 rounds per minute creates overlapping fire lanes. NVA doctrine expects a 60-second window to flank or withdraw under suppression. The M16's sustained volume collapses that window to under 20 seconds. They walked into a wall of fire and never had time to go prone. Intelligence officers capture documents describing U.S. night ambushes as high-risk corridors. One intercepted NVA logistics note from mid-1968 ranks M16 zones as more dangerous than artillery. The note recommends avoiding trails within 500 metres of known U.S. patrol bases after dark. LRRP teams exploit the weight advantage to extend patrol duration by 30%. A five-man team in I-Corps carries 2,000 rounds of 5.56 versus 1,000 rounds of 7.62. Weight equals tempo, and tempo kept us ahead of their reaction force. The improved rifle transforms ambush doctrine from firepower economy to firepower saturation. Across ambush belts, Platoons trade precision pacing for saturation windows. 20-40 seconds of overlapping three-round bursts that deny the NVA its flanking clock. Platoons front-loaded contact with saturation, then throttled to aimed fire once manoeuvre collapsed. Not just reliability parity, but a volume advantage that redefined close-range engagements. Tet Offensive, late January 1968, Saigon approaches and surrounding rubber plantations. VC and NVA forces assault urban and semi-urban positions, expecting M16 failures under sustained fire. US and ARVN forces, equipped with post-1967 rifles, hold key intersections and bunker lines. A mechanised infantry company defends a highway checkpoint near Bien Hoa for nine hours. 
The unit fired roughly 14,000 rounds, with a sub-5% stoppage rate noted in the company log. Captured documents later reveal VC planners anticipated weapon failures would enable close assault. The miscalculation costs attackers over 60 casualties at that single checkpoint. MACV intelligence briefs note enemy surprise at sustained automatic fire volumes. One captured NVA, Lieutenant states that U, S, a rifle performance exceeded pre-assault estimates. Navy SEAL teams operating in the Rungsat Special Zone adopt the M16A1 for canal ambushes. We'd submerge, surface, and the rifle ran wet after a bore shakeout. The AK tolerates submersion, but the M16's lighter weight allows faster target acquisition after exfiltration. SEAL After Action reports credit the 5.56 rounds lethality inside confined spaces like bunkers and hooches. A 1,969 captured logistics note from an NVA unit in the Mekong requests priority for captured M16S. The note specifies that M16S improve night ambush success against ARVN river patrols. Enemy forces begin valuing the weapon they once dismissed as unreliable. By late 1969, more NVA and VC fighters carry captured M16S than captured M14S. The shift signals battlefield recognition that the improved rifle offers tactical advantages. The perception inside Hanoi's logistics chain flips two years after the US Army's own assessment changed. Early 1969 interrogation summaries noted enemy planners overestimated US rifle stoppages under continuous fire a misread that cost assault tempo at roadblocks. While the AK symbolised ruggedness, captured M16S became prized for lethality and capacity. The rifle everyone blamed in 1966 becomes the rifle everyone wants by 1969. The technical fixes remain invisible to the public. Congressional hearings freeze the narrative in 1967, even as the battlefield moves forward. Performance moved. The story didn't. 1,969 to 1,970, LRRP and SEAL patrols across the Mekong Delta and Ashao Valley. The M16A1 defines long-range reconnaissance doctrine through ammunition capacity and weight. A typical five-man LRRP team carries 2,500 rounds of 5.56 on a 72-hour mission. An equivalent loadout in 7.62 NATO would require a seventh man or cut patrol duration by 40%. The weight differential translates into longer legs, faster movement, and reduced resupply dependence. Teams operating near the Laotian border execute ambushes with 60 to 90 seconds of continuous fire. The suppression density prevents enemy maneuver and forces withdrawal under contact. Three clean bursts per man. Reload. Repeat we turned trails into kill sacks. Official operational reports from I-Core and II-Core log M16 malfunction rates below 3%. The chrome-lined chamber and revised buffer system prove effective in monsoon and dry season conditions. The 20-round magazine gives way to 30-round magazines in late 1969 for line infantry units. The larger magazine extends sustained fire windows and reduces reload exposure time. A comparative study by the 101st Airborne Division finds 30-round magazines increase hit probability by 18% in ambush scenarios. The study credits reduced reload interruptions during the critical first 60 seconds of contact. By mid-1970, the M16A1 with 30-round magazines is widely fielded across combat arms by 1,970 The rifle's reputation inside the US Military flips completely from 1,967 to 1,970. Soldiers and Marines request the M16A1 over heavier alternatives in unit surveys. The transformation reflects not just reliability improvements but also tactical adaptation. Small unit leaders train fire discipline to exploit the rifle's controllable burst characteristics. The three-round burst becomes doctrine rather than a malfunction workaround. We built our ambush SOP around the M16's rate of fire and it never let us down. Night ambushes in the Central Highlands yield contact reports describing enemy forces caught in sustained automatic fire. 
The cyclic rate advantage creates psychological pressure that accelerates enemy disengagement. MACV studies note that firefight duration decreases 30% when US forces initiate with M16 saturation fire. Unit surgeons correlate that compression with fewer KIA per contact less time exposed means fewer bad minutes. Shorter engagements reduce US casualty rates and limit enemy reinforcement windows. Rifles' lethality inside 200 meters makes jungle trails and rice paddy dikes into unforgiving terrain for movement. NVA and VC forces adapt by increasing night movement distance from US. Patrol bases intercepted radio traffic from 1,970 references, automatic fire zones, as areas to avoid. The battlefield geography reshapes around the rifle's effective employment. The AK remains reliable, but its heavier cartridge limits ammunition parity. A US rifleman carries 420 rounds of 5.56, at the same weight as 210 rounds of 7.6 2 39. That 2 to 1 advantage compounds across a 40 man platoon into an 8,400 round differential. Volume of fire becomes the dominant variable in close range engagements. Three clean bursts replace click, then nothing as the motif defining U, S, small unit actions. The M16's transformation from liability to asset rewrites jungle warfare doctrine. Chrome plating, cleaning kits, and buffer upgrades solve the mechanical failures by mid-1967. Tactical adaptation leverages the rifle's weight and rate of fire advantages through 1,970. The perception gap persists in public memory even as battlefield performance vindicates the design. Congressional hearings and media coverage freeze the narrative in 1966 failure modes. Veterans returning after 1968 describe a different rifle than the one Congress investigated. The lesson centers on system integration rather than component blame. Ammunition, maintenance infrastructure, and training must align with weapon design. The Army's initial failure lies in mismatched powder and absent cleaning protocols. The subsequent success lies in rapid material fixes and doctrinal evolution. By 1970, the M16A1 defines US infantry firepower for the next two decades. The rifle's lightweight carbine descendants continue serving through the 21st century. The AK retains its reputation for ruggedness, but the M16 claims shifts from unreliable to unmatched in volume and precision. The public remembered the click, the field remembered, the three clean bursts. The story is not about one rifle defeating another, but about fixing the system surrounding the weapon. Fix the system, not just the weapon.